Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, November 26, 2013. I'm your host, Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, the policy to legally steal your guns. Then, is it time to embrace weaponized drones? And... I think that Alex Jones is a lunatic. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. An anti-freedom policy has been spreading across the United States police departments. It is the legalized theft of citizens' guns. Now, I'm not talking about forfeiture laws. This policy is to impound guns and, in extreme cases, all the guns that officers come across, whether they are involved in any crime or not. Then, they refuse to return the guns until a judge issues an order to return them, as the attorney fees needed to obtain a court order can easily be ten times what the gun is worth. Most people do not even bother. So joining me in the studio is Jakari Jackson. Jakari, they are seizing guns, there's no crime involved, they don't have any rhyme or reason for doing it, it's, it's theft. This is ludicrous. Well, they have a reason to do this, Leanne. It's because they want your guns, even though they say, we don't want your guns, just like uh, Anthony Gucciardi and Alex experienced down at the Alamo. We don't want your guns. It says on this paper you want to take all of our assault rifles away. Well, we don't really consider an assault rifle to be a gun. We don't consider anything that you want for self-defense to be a gun, but we'll touch on that in just one moment. Yes, the article that you're referencing from Ammoland.com, headline, legalized gun, excuse me, legalized theft of guns. And this isn't just something that's going on in California. We know it's been going on there for a while. It's also Ohio, Arizona, Wisconsin, where the police show up, the whoever the repo agents may be, and they have to come and seize your guns. And earlier this year, Bloomberg put out an article headline, California's gun repo men have a nerve-wracking job. Mm. And Leanne, what this article is about, the guys who have to go and take these guns, and if you read it, it's written in such a way, oh, these, these poor guys, these brave souls who have to go and confiscate these guns, to confiscate these guns. Mm. I thought nobody was trying to take the guns, just like they did during Hurricane Katrina, but that's neither here nor there. But they say, you know, some of these guys have mental issues. Some of these guys have domestic abuse issues. Some of these guys are convicted felons, even though I don't think that all convicted felons should necessarily have their guns taken. You got guys, uh, your minor league drug offenders, guys who write bogus checks. They're, now they're convicted felons and they can't protect themselves. But they say that because some of these guys have these various issues, now they have the right to go and confiscate guns from pretty much anybody. They see you cleaning your gun in your garage, now they have to send a SWAT team. Or, you know, uh, somebody takes a gun out, you know, in their uh, apartment parking lot, walking to their car, now they shut down the schools. They did that here in the city of Austin. You know, some guy was just walking to his car, you know, duck season or whatnot, and now they got to shut down the schools. It's going on, they want your guns, it's a bunch of bull, and they keep acting like, no, we're not, we, we don't want to take your guns away, we just want to take uh, 150 plus guns away off the streets, Diane Feinstein. They just want to say that you can't have X number of bullets in your magazine, Diane Feinstein, and all these other things, Joe Biden, go out and shoot your shotgun off your balcony, even though if you do that, you're going to be hit with some charges because that is very much illegal. They even tell police not to shoot out warning shots, but they're going to tell you to do it just so you can get caught up in the system. Right. Well, and it's it, they saw that everyone was so upset. Oh, you know, you're not going to violate our Second Amendment. Well, now they're just going to bypass that and violate your Fourth Amendment to be protected from unlawful search and seizures. Yeah, and, and that's the thing that people need to realize. Like, we had uh, good guys constitutional sheriffs like Nick Finch down in Florida. He said, I don't like all these BS gun grabbing laws here in my county. He threw out the charges on the guy Then they took him to court, Sheriff Nick Finch. He beat the rap, he beat the ride, and I'm very happy that he did that. And not just that, because they say that uh, in this current uh, MLN article that we're referencing, that they'll take your guns away, and as you said, you know, they're pretty much extorting people. If you want your guns back, you're going to have to pay us X number of dollars. And a lot of people can't afford to get these things. You know, you go buy a, a $400 pistol or whatnot, and then they want to charge you X number of dollars to get it back. That's ridiculous, especially some of these guys, they have guns that really don't have a numerical value. They're sentimental guns, they're mm -hmm. custom-made guns, they're guns they used to go hunting with their grandpa and their granddad and their mom went out fishing with them. Right. These are things that belong in their family, and now they have to go ask permission of the state to have their own property back. It's a bunch of bull. Right, and it's not even a law, or they just say, oh, it's, it's our, our policy. policy. Oh, it's, it's our, our policy It's our policy that you can't son. breathe today. Yeah, it's, it's we our saw policy. your kid. It's our policy that will show up and tase your kid in the classroom. <laughs> he falls, he busts his head, and now he's still potentially facing charges. Exactly. That's their policy. That's yeah, perfectly fine. Yeah, it's just our fine. policy. It's, I mean, uh, and it's more than that. But I'm glad to see guys like uh, Sheriff David Clark 
out there in Milwaukee. And he's saying that, you know, if you are involved in a crime or you're suspected of a crime and some of these things like domestic violence cases, they may take your firearms away for a brief period. But he's saying, hey, once you're clear to the charges, I want you to have your firearm back within 48 hours. So I definitely salute Mr. Clark out there in uh, out there in Milwaukee for at least stepping up and saying, hey, you know, I understand there can be miscommunications, maybe some he said, she said. But once you clear to your charges, I want you to have your firearms back. And Leon, I want these people to have their firearms back as well. Your firearms should be with you, not with these bureaucrats, not with these gun grabbers, not like these people out in Chicago where they take your guns at the gun buybacks and turn around and sell them again. Excuse me, that was in Arizona that they did that. They did a similar thing in Chicago as well. But, you know, people think, you know, I'll go turn in my gun at the gun buyback, Leanne. Then they turn around, sell it, make profit off of it. Right. And like they, they said, the gun that shot Gaffy, Gabby Giffords could very well be back out on the street right now. Probably. And it's just, and, it, and it's just you know, these people can't protect you. They want you to think that they can protect you. And, you know, we've seen the situations over and over again. With all due respect, you know, like people like Miss Gabby Giffords, you know, who was shot. The situations at Sandy Hook, the situations at Caliban, the situations at Aurora. They want you to think they can, they can protect you. They got there just in time to draw uh, outlines and, you know, bring out the body bags, but they didn't save anybody. The police are cleanup crews. You know, it's well-intentioned as they may be, and I do believe that many of them do have good intentions. You know, they're a cleanup crew. They can't stop every crime. And we're seeing it move on. It's not just... The guns, Leanne, if people don't have guns, they'll move to different measures. Exactly. Like we're seeing with the tasers or in some cases hammers. Or then, of course, with this new knockout game, they just go old school and using their fists to beat victims. And that's what it is. You know, they can take away this gun. They can take away that gun. They can take away the hammers. They can, I mean, I guess they may get to the point where they're chopping off people's hands. But people will still find a way to assault you if that's what their desire is. The best thing you can do is to arm yourself. Exactly. Well, that's why we have that Second Amendment in place. Thank you, Jakari. All right, well, is the mainstream media trying to convince you that you don't need a gun to protect yourself against mob violence, or are they once again complicit in covering up racially motivated crime? The New York Times is reporting that the knockout game might not be a spreading menace, but a myth. Now, the story opens with reporting of another assault that just happened last Friday, saying that it was possibly part of the so-called knockout game, adding that this attack is just one of a growing list of such crimes. But they report that the police officials in several cities say that the game amounted to little more than an urban myth, and that the attacks in question might be nothing more than the sort of random assaults that have always occurred. Police are particularly concerned that widespread coverage could create the atmosphere where such a game could take hold. So again, are they stopping copycats or do they just want to reassure you that you don't need a gun to protect yourself? Now, towards the end of the article, they bring up the issue of race by saying that much of the fear sown by the reports may have racial roots. They quote Jeffrey Butts, who says, there's an element who want to see this through the lens of race. Now, here is the issue with reporting and journalism. Everyone is so sensitive when it comes to race. If you're reporting on a car wreck, there is no need for you to say that a black man was involved or a white woman was involved. That's irrelevant to the story. But when you're reporting on something like the knockout game that is consistently, at least with all the videos that we have seen and the reports of people bragging on Facebook, it's consistently young black men who are attacking people of another race. Therefore, it is very relevant, and this could be a potentially racially motivated crime. Now, the downplaying of race is evident in the New York Times article, which never once mentions the race of the perpetrators, although they do bring up that some of the victims were Jewish. So I can almost guarantee that if the perpetrators in the knockout game were young white males who were attacking elderly African-American women or, you know, young black men, this would be being reported as a racially motivated hate crime, like it is. Now, up next, researchers have unveiled their latest drones with facial recognition cameras that can obey visual and vocal commands. They use a facial scoring system, and so each drone's camera determines which direction a user is focused towards. Once the drone with the highest face score has been targeted, small color-changing LEDs provide confirmation to the user. Simple commands such as take off allows for complete hands-free control, while commands such as 
U2 or U3 allows multiple drones to obey the same order simultaneously. Through the use of vision-mediated gestural interface, the drones also have the ability to be controlled silently by simple hand motions. And once a drone recognizes that it has been visually targeted, a user can gain control through a right-hand wave while a left-hand wave removes it. But the lamestream media wants you to embrace facial recognition technology. They say it can help to fight crime. CNN says not only will embracing Big Brother help to fight terrorism, but can also process payments in the blink of an eye. The senior vice president of Digital for TPN, Inc., says that the more people get out of it, the more they'll surrender to it. But that's not all CNN hopes that you'll surrender to. They want you to embrace the police force of the future. This is an earlier article from September. They say police forces of the future see technology such as analytics, biometrics, and facial recognition as keys to effectively fighting crime and maximizing the time officers spend in the field. And of course, if the DHS has any say about the police force of the future and how they're gonna police the homeland, there won't be any humans on the field at all, just robots with guns. Commercial companies showed off their weaponized robots to U.S. Army officers at Fort Benning in Georgia on Thursday. Robotics companies like Northrop Grumman, 5D Robotics, iRobot, and HDT Robotics demonstrated how well their machines could move over rough terrain, carry hundreds of pounds of supplies, and follow soldiers on the move. On Thursday, four of the companies demonstrated how their robots, equipped with M240 machine guns, could accurately fire at targets 150 meters away. Alex Jones and InfoWars have been warning you for years about the New World Order's plan to merge with machines and then police the peasantry of the world with their killer drones while they live off Earth in luxury. And what do we get for it? I, I want to be very careful in choosing my words here. I think that Alex Jones is a lunatic. Uh, an absolute, die-hard, insane lunatic. And I think to even mention him in the same sentence as Amy Goodman is an incredible insult to Amy Goodman. Alex Jones has forwarded some of the most outrageous, ridiculous conspiracy theories about how the world works. And whatever good he might be doing in some of, of, of what he does is completely overshadowed by the fact that he is pushing outright lies and propaganda on a regular basis. And I think it ultimately subverts the important real journalism that independent journalists are doing on a regular basis um, by giving the impression that everyone's running around wearing a tinfoil hat. And I, so no, I wouldn't even put him in the same category as Amy Goodman on, on any day. That's right. The mainstream media has called Alex Jones an absolute lunatic for warning about such things as Obamacare's death panels. And that's something else about which the president was not fully forthcoming and, and straightforward. Right, so you believe that there will be rationing, a.k.a. death panels? built into the plan it's not it's not like it's not like a guess or like a judgment that's 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 going to be part of how can costs are controlled that's a trade-off society is making because of very very high medical costs and a lack of willingness to say you know is spending a million dollars on that last three months of life for that patient would it be better not to lay off the those ten teachers and to make that trade-off in medical costs but that's called the death panel uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. When people like Bill Gates suggest killing Granny, he's seen as a future-thinking genius. But when Alex Jones warns about death panels or the fact that Obamacare is going to raise the premiums and cause millions of people to be dropped from their insurance, he is a stark, raving lunatic. What is die-hard, insane lunacy is that people still go to the mainstream media to get their news. Now, stick around because after the break, I'm going to be interviewing the Comet Hunter to find out if Ison is going to bring the impending apocalypse. Hint, it's not. <laughs> and then I am going to tell you about something really gross that could potentially wiggle its way into your Thanksgiving dinner. This is a conspiracy by the technocrats, by the ruling elite, by the eugenicists that want to dumb us down. 
This is the iodine conspiracy. Our government wasn't always a eugenicist-based predatory group. Back in the 1920s, the federal government pressured salt manufacturers and bread producers to add iodine because they knew that iodine deficiencies were causing massive decreases in IQ, birth defects, and it was a health crisis all across the United States and in Europe as well. In the decade after iodine was added to staple foods, there was a 15-point increase in IQs in the areas that had previously been deficient. So what did the federal government do a couple decades later? They took the good halogen iodine out and added another bad one, bromine. And they put the worst of the group, fluoride and fluorine derivatives, in our water supply and began using it as a pesticide on the crops. Let's be clear about this. Adding bromine to the food supply is banned in the EU, banned in Canada, and banned in many other nations because it is a toxic poison listed in those countries. I've done deep research on the globalist program to dumb down the population to make us more manageable. It is eugenics. And I personally take the highest quality form of unbound iodine, nascent iodine, in a kosher certified, non-GMO certified glycerin base. I've interviewed the experts, people like Dr. Brownstein and pharmacist Ben Fuchs, and of course, Dr. Edward Group. And across the board, the consensus is iodine is the missing piece of the puzzle. And not just iodine, but high quality, unbound, pure iodine. Bottom line, this is something on record our bodies need. I've gone out and found the best source for myself and my family. I hope you'll visit InfoWarsLife.com and get our InfoWars Life Survival Shield. It really does incredible things. And we've got nothing but positive reviews from our listeners. And this also helps support our news operation and the info war while we get the iodine we need and block the fluoride and the other members of the halogen that are so bad for our bodies. Check out the information. Do the research for yourself. Talk to your physician and then decide whether you want to drink fluoridated water that Harvard major studies admits is giving people brain cancer and bone cancer and lowering their IQ or whether you want to find a high quality source of iodine. Consult your physician, do your research, and make a decision. But whatever you do, don't just ignore this message because all of my research shows this is absolutely key to getting people out of the brain fog that they've been artificially put into by the social engineers. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today. Comet Ison's Day of Reckoning is nearly upon us. The comet will reach its closest point to the sun on Thursday, and all bets are off as to whether or not the comet is going to make its journey around the sun. Joining me today is Don Mockles. He's the comet hunter, and he's going to talk to us about what could be the celestial event of the century. All right, Don Mockles, the comet hunter, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Leanne. So when ISON was discovered in 2012, it was uh, shining really brightly and it prompted some astronomers to say that it could be the comet of the century, eventually possibly glowing in the night sky as bright as our own moon. But what does that look like now? Well, some of those predictions were perhaps uh, over overstated. Uh, the comet will get bright and is getting brighter. However, at the time it's at its brightest, it's, it's very close to the sun as seen from the earth so it's hard hard to see right now uh, but it's behaving pretty well on track there is some indication uh, with the recent outburst that it had um, about a week and a half ago that um, that outburst in brightness which brightened it quite a bit um, it's kind of calmed down since then so we'll have to watch over the next few days to see if it uh, starts to dim as it gets closer to the sun or if it continues to brighten. Mm. And so what what's actually causing it to be the brightness and, and the dimming? And I know that this one actually had, I think, six tails at one time. What was causing that? And is that is that common? It's like a dirty snowball. 
and this one has a nucleus, or the center of it is a snowball that's about three miles across. And as it moves closer to the sun, um, it, it begins to brighten. And when it goes half the distance to the sun from any distance, a, a typical comet will get 16 times brighter. This particular comet has an orbit that brings it really, really, really close to the sun. And so if you do the math and if it, if it behaves normally, it will get really, really bright. Uh, and it might have a very nice long tail. It's coming in on the morning side of the sun, so it can best be seen in the morning. It's going to whip around the sun on Thanksgiving Day, the 28th of, of November, and then back into the morning sky where it can best be seen uh, in, in the morning before, before morning twilight. And so as far as having a lot of tails, uh, you know, Ison, is this a rare occurrence with the multiple tails, or is that something that you, you've seen a lot with your work? Well, usually a comet will have two tails, an ion tail, which is kind of like a gas tail, and a dust tail. The dust tail is forming very nicely. The ion tail we've had for a little while already. Um, it's had some extensions off on the side of the nucleus, and astronomers are kind of wondering what those are. They really aren't calling them tails, they're calling them more like wings. And um, mm -hmm. some comets seem to display that. It might be due to matter coming off of certain portions of the nucleus as it rotates. Um, material comes off of it in unequal areas. So that might be causing that. Mm. So this is probably very exciting as an astronomer, someone that kind of looks to the sky. This seems to be kind of a rare occurrence in our century. It is rare that a comet comes that close to the sun of this size. Mm -hmm. There are sun mm -hmm. grazers that are found on the SOHO satellite images. They're very much smaller than this and much, much fainter. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, mm -hmm. this comet uh, has been coming in for millions of years and it only got bright enough to see when it got a little bit past uh, Jupiter's orbit, between Jupiter and Saturn's orbit was where it was discovered. And by then it had become bright enough that it could be picked up with a telescope and a very sensitive camera. At that time, it was still beyond reach of most of our telescopes to visually observe. Uh, I began to see it as it got closer to the sun about two months ago in the morning sky, as did many other amateurs. Um, in the last few days, it's been visible in binoculars and uh, to the unaided eye. However, beginning about two days ago, it was so much in the twilight that it was difficult to see. So now the only imaging that's done is by um, radio telescope and by satellites that orbit the sun and do not have to, uh, are not interfered with by the atmosphere of the Earth. So as the comet gets closer to the sun, how come it hasn't melted already? It is in the process of melting, as all comets do. As they move closer to the sun and get hotter, the material, the solid material on the snowball sublimes or turns directly into the gas, which forms the head of the comet and the tail of the comet. But the nucleus generally remains intact. One concern raised by astronomers over the last few days is that perhaps the uh, brightening event of about 10 days ago might have been caused by a fragment breaking off of the nucleus. Mm. That doesn't mean the nucleus itself has broken into many, many pieces, but sometimes a piece will break off and we have a, a temporary brightening. Uh, over time, over the next few days, we'll see if the comet continues to brighten or if it starts to, to dim. It should be brightening until Thanksgiving when it gets closest to the sun. After that, as it moves away from the sun, it should naturally dim. And then, so the so Ison is moving really fast, 248 miles per second toward the sun. It's going to uh, reach its closest point of proximity to the sun on Thanksgiving Day. What happens if it gets sucked into the gravitational pull of the sun? Is that a possibility? And what would happen if that was the case? It's unlikely the course will change so much such that it will be drawn into the sun. It will miss the sun, uh, and, and it's expected to, and it will stay on track. 
the question is what part of it's going to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, a breakup of the nucleus would cause the comet to become even brighter for a while as more and more material is exposed to the sun. If, on the other hand, the nucleus begins to dissolve and just break down into tiny particles, we may not have a very bright comet after it rounds the sun. If it stays intact, we may have a pretty good show in the morning sky after it rounds the sun. And so let's say that it does make that journey around intact. What is it going to look like? I know right now it's, it's mostly being seen in the southern hemisphere. And then as December uh, rolls in, we'll be able to see it in the northern hemisphere. What do, you, what do you think that we might be able to see with the naked eye? We've been having a, a good view of it in both the northern and southern hemisphere for the last couple months. The comet with the unaided eye might put on a pretty good show the first uh, middle of the first week of December. You have to get up in the morning about an hour, an hour and a half before dawn or before sunrise while the sky is still fairly dark and you need to be away from city lights and have a good low eastern horizon. And uh, the tail of the comet will rise first uh, followed by the head of the comet. Um, the tail could be pretty long. Uh, the geometry would favor that we would we, we could see a fairly long tail of uh, 10, 20 degrees. But that depends upon several things. The way the comet behaves, and comets are unpredictable. Uh, your skies, you need to have dark skies to see the comet well, and how well your eyes are adapted and used to being able to see uh, faint objects. Well, then I guess we will definitely be looking forward to that, keeping our fingers crossed that it makes its journey around the sun. Don, you've discovered 10 comets, is that correct? And how, how did you become a comet hunter? <laughs> uh, I've discovered, uh, visually, I've discovered 11 comets mm. in, in the last mm. uh, 35 years, since 1975. And um, I do that by scanning the sky with my telescope and looking through the eyepiece for a faint fuzzy objects. Most of them are galaxies or clusters, but sometimes one would be a new comet. I then reported it to the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory for confirmation. Uh, comet ISON was found by amateurs also, but they were using a camera connected to the telescope, and it can see much, much fainter than I can visually. Mm. So what, are there any perks to discovering a comet? Well, uh, your name is attached to the comet. Um, the orbit is determined by the Smithsonian, so once you discover it and report it, uh, your, your job is done. They, they handle it from there. Um, I have a couple comets that I've discovered that come by every five years. One of them also goes very close to the sun, not quite as close as ISON, but every five years it puts on a pretty good show as it goes around the sun. Which one is that? What's It's the... Mackles, or I'm sorry, the Mackles, uh, 1985, we got the 1988. 1986 uh, E. 1986 also, E. Yeah, also known as P96 or Periodic Comet Mackles 1. Ooh, so exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so are you going to be holding any public viewing events for Comet Ison or live streaming? We, uh, there's a group of us astronomers in the area here, and we set up telescopes and invite the public to come out and look through our telescopes. On Saturday, December 7th, we'll be uh, out in the pre-dawn skies in Auburn, California, setting up our telescopes to show people not just the comet, the planet Saturn will be out, the moon will be out, things like that too, but we'll be showing comet ice on then. If it continues to put on a good show, we'll be scheduling other star parties. And uh, there are astronomy clubs around the world that are setting, going to be setting up telescopes to show people the comet. The biggest problem is it is in the morning. It's not, not in the evening, so you have to get up early and, and go out to watch it. Yeah, that's the big problem for me is <laughs> getting up a few <laughs> hours before the sunrise. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, and definitely we'll check out the CometHunter.com and see if you have any new photos for us once it makes its journey around the sun. Thank you, Don. Right. Thank you. <laughs> if you need anything else, let me know. Take care now. Take care. All right. Well, while you're out there enjoying your Thanksgiving dinner and hoping to catch a glimpse of Comet Ison as it potentially makes impact with the sun, 
make sure to take a glimpse at your food. Now we've reported before about the disturbing FDA limits for food defect levels that allow a certain amount of rodent hair and feces to be in your food. Like uh, canned mushrooms, for example, that you might use on your green bean casserole. The FDA allows 20 maggots per can. Ugh. But live bugs in food is another story. Fox 7 here in Austin reported on a woman who found crawling maggots in her cliff bar. A spokesperson for the FDA told My Fox Austin that the presence of live insects, maggots, worms, etc. in a product is not acceptable. Ugh. You think? Ugh. Well, stick around after the show because Rob Dew, yes, the same adventurous Rob Dew who ate a live cricket here on the show in accordance with UN demands to eat more bugs, he is going to take a bite into his own personal stash of cliff bars to find out if those maggots were just an isolated incident here in Austin. I really hope so. Now, stick around throughout the week. Even though we're going to be going through uh, onto a skeleton crew here in the studio for the Thanksgiving holiday, we're still going to be giving you lots of content that you have yet to see. It hasn't aired. And of course, if you are a subscriber to Prison Planet TV, as always, you can share your username and password with up to 10 other people. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. Now, please enjoy yourselves this holiday weekend. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at InfoWars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at InfoWars.com slash show. I'm actually going to break it apart and look at it first. I love Cliff Bars. I eat them usually for lunch every day. I do not see anything in here other than white chocolate macadamia nut goodness. So, Rob, do were you concerned when you saw the video of the maggots crawling around in the Cliff Bar? Not at all. As you know, I've been on InfoWars Nightly News eating grasshoppers in order to fulfill the UN's agenda of having this all farm insects and use that as our protein sources. Now, this looks pretty good. So, Does, yeah. would you have any reservations of eating Cliff Bars in the future? I understand that in the processed food industry, they do allow for things to get in. And I understand that some of those things do get in. I've never seen one in a Cliff Bar and I've probably eaten thousands of Cliff Bars in my life. And, uh, I, I do know this, the guy who owns Cliff Bar does contribute to, um, he's for GMO labeling. So he could be being attacked by the mainstream media for being pro GMO labeling. I know he's given up, he gave a lot to the, the proposition out in California last year. He gave a lot to that. So this may be a, um, they may be coming after him at this point. So I don't know, but I love Cliff Bars and I eat them every day usually for lunch. And I always have one in my camera bag because you're out in the field, running around, need something quick, Cliff Bar, it's what I eat. 